Hi guys, it's me, Grandma Lily, and that's right, it's time for story time with Grandma Lily. So, remember I told you yesterday that we were gonna go back and visit Dr. Seuss today? So I got out our big Dr. Seuss book, and I took off the dust jacket, which I put down to the side here, our shiny dust jacket, and I looked in my book, and today we are going to read a story called, If I Ran the Zoo. Okay, this is the story is of I Ran the Zoo. It was originally published, guys, in 1950, which was 70 years ago. So, that is today's story. I hope you all had a really great day. It was Thursday today. The week is almost over. Again, before I do anything else, I want to say hello and I love you to my favorite grandchildren, Kylie. Jordan, Elijah, and Serenity. I love you all and I miss you so much and I can't wait to see you again. Somebody said, what are you gonna do when this quarantine is over? And I said, the first thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna hug my kids and grandkids because I miss you guys so much. But anyway, here we go. We are going to read our book called If I Ran the Zoo in our very, very big Dr. Seuss book. It's a pretty good zoo, said young Gerald McGrew, and the fellow who runs it seems proud of it too. But if I ran the zoo, said young Gerald McGrew, I'd make a few changes. That's just what I'd do. The lions and tigers and that kind of stuff, they have up here now are not quite good enough. You see things like these in just any old zoo. They're awfully old fashioned. I want something new. So I'd open each cage. I'd unlock every pen. Let the animals go and start over again. And somehow or other, I think I could find some beasts of a much more unusual kind. A four-footed lion's not much of a beast. The one in my zoo will have 10 feet at least. Five legs on the left and five more on the right. Then people will stare and they'll say, what a sight. This zookeeper, new keeper, Gerald's quite keen. That's the gall darndest lion that I have ever seen. All those paws on that lion. My new zoo, McGrew Zoo, will make people talk. My new zoo, McGrew Zoo, will make people gawk at the strangest odd creatures that ever did walk. I'll get for my zoo a new sort of a hen who roosts in another hen's top knot. And then another one roosts in the top knot of his, and another in his, and another in his, and so forth and upward and onward. Gee whiz. But that's just a start. I'll do better than that. They'll see me next day in my zookeeper's hat, coming into my zoo with an elephant cat. They'll be so surprised they'll all swallow their gum. They'll ask when they see my strange animals come, where do you suppose he gets things like that from? His animals all have such very odd faces. I'll bet he must hunt them in rather odd places. And that's what I'll do, said young Gerald McGrew. If you want to catch beasts you don't see every day, you have to go places quite out of the way. You have to go places no others can get to. You have to get cold and you have to get wet too. You have to go up past the North Pole where the frozen winds squeal. I'll go and I'll hunt in my Skeegle-mobile and bring back a family of what do you know? And that's how my new zoo, McGrew Zoo, will grow. I'll hunt in the mountains of Zamba Matant with helpers who all wear their eyes at a slant and capture a fine fluffy bird called the Bustard who only eats custard with sauce made of mustard and also a very fine beast called the Flustered, who only eats mustard with sauce made of custard. I don't know if I'd like either of those things. I'll catch them in caves and I'll catch them in brooks. I'll catch them in crannies, I'll catch them in nooks that you don't read about in geography books. I'll catch them in countries that no one can spell, like the country of Matafapatafapel, 
in a country in a country like that, if the hunter is clever, he'll hunt up some beasts that you never saw, ever. I'll load up five boats with a family of jotes, whose feet are like cows, but wear squirrel skin coats, and sit down like dogs, but have voices like goats, excepting they can't sing the very high notes. And then I'll go down to the wilds of Nantucket and capture a family of lunks in a bucket. Then people will say, now I like that boy heaps. His new goo, new zoo, McGrew zoo, is growing by leaps. He captures them wild and he captures them meek. He captures them slim and he captures them sleek. What do you suppose he will capture next week? I'll capture one tiny, I'll capture one cute. I'll capture a deer that no hunter would shoot. A deer that's so nice he could sleep in your bed if it weren't for those horns that he has on his head. And speaking of horns that are just a bit queer, I'll bring back a very odd family of deer, a father, a mother, two sisters, a brother, whose horns are connected from one to the other, whose horns are so mixed they can't tell them apart, can't tell where they end and can't tell where they start. Each deer's mighty puzzled. He's never yet found if his horns are hers or the other way around. I'll capture them fat and I'll capture them scrawny. I'll capture a scraggle foot mulligatawny, a high-stepping animal fast as the wind from the blistering sands of the desert of Zind. This beast is the beast that the brave chieftains ride when they want to go fast to find some place to hide. A mulligatawny is fine for my zoo, and so is a chieftain. I'll bring one back, too. In the far western part of southeast North Dakota lives a very fine animal called the iota. But I'll capture one who is even much finer in the northeastern west part of South Carolina. When people see him, they will say, now by thunder, this new zoo, McGrew Zoo, is really a wonder. More beasts are quite, most beasts are quite friendly, but still in some lands, some beasts are too dangerous to catch with bare hands. For those that are ugly and vicious and mean, I'll build a bad animal catching machine. It's rather expensive to build such a kit, but with it, a hunter can never get bit. A zoo should have bugs, so I'll capture a thwarrel whose legs are snarled up in a terrible snarl. And then I'll go out and I'll capture some chugs, some keen shooter, mean shooter, bean shooter bugs. I'll go to the African island of Yurka and bring back a tizzle-topped tufted mazurka, a kind of canary with quite a tall throat. His neck is so long, if he swallows an oat for breakfast the first day of April, they say, it has to go down such a very long way that it gets to his stomach the 15th of May. Wow, that's a long time for something you get from someone's mouth to their stomach. That's longer even, that's almost as long as we've been in quarantine. I'll bag a big bug who is very surprising, a feller who has a propeller for rising and zooming across, making cross-country hops from Texas to Boston with only two stops. Now that sort of thing for a bug is just tops. And when I've caught him, then the next thing you know, I'll go and I'll capture a wild tic-tac-toe with X's that win and with zeros that lose. He'll look mighty good in that zoo of McGrews. I'll bring back a gusset, a gherkin, a gasket, and also a gooch from the winds of Nantasket. And eight Persian princes will carry the basket. But what their names are, I don't know. So don't ask it. In a cave in Khartoum lives a beast called the Natch that no other hunter's been able to catch. He's hidden for years in his cave with a pout, and no one's been able to make him come out. But I'll coax him out with a wonderful meal that's cooked in my, by my cooks in my cooker mobile. They'll fix up a dish that is just to his taste. Three chicken croquettes made of library paste then sprinkled with peanut shucks, pickled and spiced, then baked at 600 degrees, and then iced. It's mighty hard cooking to cook up such feasts, but that's how the new zoo, McGrew Zoo, gets beasts.
I'll go to the faraway mountains of Topsk, near the river of Nobsk, and I'll bring back an obsk. A sort of a thingamabopsk, of a, who only eats rhubarb, rhubarb and corn on the kopsk. Then people will flock to my zoo in a mopsk. McGrew, they will say, does a wonderful jobsk. He hunts with such vim and he humps with, hunts with such vigor. His new zoo, McGrew Zoo, gets bigger and bigger. And speaking of birds, there's the Russian Paluski whose head ski is red ski and belly, bell ski is blue ski. I'll get one of them for my Zuski Magruski. And the whole town will gasp. Why this boy never sleeps? No keeper before ever kept what he keeps. There's no telling what that young fellow will do. And then, just to show them, I'll sail to Katru and bring back an it kutch, a preep, a nurkel, a nerd, and a prue, and a seersucker too. A lot of things. I'll hunt in the jungles of Hippo No Hungus and bring back a flock of wild Bippo No Bungus. The Bippo No Bungus from Hippo No Hungus are better than those down in Dippo No Dungus and smarter than those out in Nippo No Nungus. And that's why I'll catch them in Hippo No Hungus instead of those others in Nungus and Dungus. And people will say when they see those bips bounding, this zookeeper, newkeeper, newkeeper, simply astounding. He travels so far that you'd think he would drop. When do you suppose this young fellow will stop? Stop? Well, I should. But I won't stop until I've captured the fizzum a wizum a dill the world's biggest bird from the island of Guark, who eats only pine trees and spits out the bark. And boy, when I get him back home to my park, the whole world will say, Young McGrew's made his mark. He's built a zoo better than Noah's whole ark. These wonderful, marvelous beasts that he chooses has made him the greatest of all the McGrew's. Wow, they'll all cheer. What this zoo must be worth. It's the Galdarnest Zoo on the face of the earth. Look at that. Look at all those creatures. Yes, that's what I'd do, said young Gerald McGrew. I'd make a few changes if I ran the zoo. The end. And on this page, guys, you can see that here are some animals that Dr. Seuss made up that don't really exist. Dr. Seuss has a lot of creatures that he makes up. And some of them are, are, are funny and some of them are silly. And all of them are, excuse me, pretty cool. And I'm bending over because I am picking up my dusk jacket. And I'm going to put it back on my book, Your Favorite Seuss. Tomorrow, we are going to read another story, and I don't know what it will be yet, but remember, guys, if there is a particular storybook that you like and you want Grandma Lily to read it, just let me know, let your moms know. Believe me, I get new books every week, and I will be more than happy to see if I can find your favorite and read it for you. That's all for now. I love you all. Grandma Lily says bye-bye. Stay healthy, and I love you.